Welcome to Orbital Dynamics Part 4. This is a continuation of Part 3, where I talk about how the ancients figured out the relative sizes of the Sun, the Moon, and the Earth. Erasthenes was a Greek mathematician, poet, athlete, geographer, and astronomer. He invented the discipline of geography, including inventing the system of latitude and longitude. He figured out the circumference of the Earth with amazing accuracy. He also figured out the reason for the seasons. I'm going to describe how he did both things. He knew that in the summer, uh, on the summer solstice at local noon in the city of Sin, on the Tropic of Cancer, the sun would appear directly overhead. There was a well in Sin, and at the summer solstice, the sunlight shined straight down the well. At the same time, there was a pillar in Alexandria that cast a shadow. The sun wasn't going straight down in Alexandria, confirming Aristotle's theory that the Earth was a sphere. Erasthenes had somebody measure the length of the shadow in Alexandria. If the pillar was 10 meters high, he would have measured a shadow of 1.26 meters. Let's make this angle theta. The tangent of theta is the ratio of the length of the opposite side over the adjacent side. That's 1.26 over 10. If we know the lengths and want to find the angle, we use the inverse of the tangent function, which is the arc tangent. The arc tangent of 1.26 over 10 is 7.2. Look at the picture on the left. The triangle formed by the pillar and its shadow is similar to the angle formed by the center of the Earth's sun in Alexandria. From this, Erasthenes knew that the angle between Sun and Alexandria is 7.2 degrees. To make this clear, I want to recreate Erasthenes' geometric construction with ge ge geometry sketch pad. First, I'm going to create a circle that represents the Earth, and I'll label this point Earth's center. This point will be Alexandria. I'll construct a ray that represents the sun shining directly overhead of Alexandria. And then I'll construct a line segment between the Earth center and Alexandria. This point is Sen. The sun is so far away from the Earth that the angle of the sun's rays are virtually parallel at any point on the Earth. I'm now going to extend the line, create a line saying between Earth's center and sun. And because this is a straight line intersecting two parallel lines, this angle here. which I'll measure. Is equal to this angle here. Which I'll measure as well. Now I'll hide these two points. I'll now construct the pillar at Sen. That's the top of the pillar. And then I'll construct a line segment. The sun shines down on the top of the pillar along a line that's parallel to the two other sun lines. The intersection of that sun line and the earth defines the edge of the shadow cast by the pillar. And I'll make the shadow a black line segment.
if I divide the length of the shadow, by the length of the pillar, I get the tangent. If I take the arc tangent, I get the angle between the sun line and the pillar, which is equal to the interior angle formed by sen, the center of the earth and Alexandria. In geometry sketchpad, these angles aren't exact. That's because I drew a straight line for the shadow and it's actually an arc. We know that the interior angle between Sun and Alexandria is 7.2 degrees. I can construct that angle and move the geometric construction I just created near that point. It's hard to get it exact, but this is close. This shows you how to set this up geometrically. If we go back to the Wikipedia diagram, we know the angle is 7.2 degrees. 7.2 divided by 360 is 1 over 50. The distance from Alexandria to Sen is thus 1 50th of the circumference of the Earth. Erasmus knew the distance from Alexandria and Sen was 4,400 stays, which is how they measured distance back then. 4,400 stays equates to 793.8 kilometers. 793.8 times 50 is then the circumference of the Earth. And that's 39,690 kilometers. That was far greater than anyone had thought. Since he knew the value of pi, Erasmus could also compute the radius of the Earth. He calculated, calculated that it was 6,317 kilometers. The accuracy of Erasmus' measurement would have been reduced by the fact that Sen is not directly south of Alexandria, and also that the Sun appears as a disk located at a finite distance from the Earth instead of as a point source of light at an infinite distance. Also, overland distance measurements were not reliable, especially for travel along the Nile, which meanders. Given these errors, the accuracy of Erasmus's calculations is surprising. The actual circumference of the Earth is 40,075 kilometers. Erasmus was, was within 1%. His radius was only off by 61 kilometers, amazingly accurate for his time. Erasmus also discovered the reason for the seasons. He theorized that the Earth is tilted along an axis of spin relative to the sun. During some times of the year, part of the Earth is tilted toward the sun, and during other parts, it is tilted away. Some think that, think that summers are hotter because the Earth is closer to the sun during summer and is farther away during winter. In the Northern Hemisphere, the opposite is actually true. The Earth is farther away during the summer and is closer during the winter. It's the tilt that makes the weather hotter in summer in the Northern Hemisphere. There are names for the transitions between seasons. Here's the sun's path around the Earth. Bear with me here. Like I said, later I'm going to show you a heliocentric model of the solar system that has the Earth orbiting the sun. For this explanation, it's simpler to consider the sun's path around the Earth. Let's start with winter solstice. It occurs on or about 21 December. It marks the beginning of winter in the north and summer in the south. Next is the vernal equinox. It marks the beginning of spring in the north and fall in the south. Next is the summer solstice. It marks the beginning of summer in the north and winter in the south. Last is the autumnal equinox. It marks the beginning of the fall in the north and the spring in the south. Hipparchus measured the time between the equinoxes and solstices. Here are the times that he measured. So let's now put this in heliocentric terms. We're going to exaggerate the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit, so this is clear. The sun appears offset slightly, and Hipparchus figured that out. Here's the closest point, which we call perihelion. In 2014, it occurred on 4 January. I include the year because the date changes year to year. 
Here's the distance. Here's the farthest point, which we call aphelion. In 2014, it occurred on 4 July. And here's the distance. Now we can lay in the seasons. Summer solstice is on 21 June. Remember, that's when the sun shines longest in the north and shortest in the south. That's about 12 and a half days prior to the aphelion point. Note that the Earth at summer solstice is 12 and a half days from aphelion when it, is when it is furthest from the sun. It's ironic that in the north, during our hot season, the sun is farthest away. We'll go counterclockwise from here. Here's the autumnal equinox. That's the time of the year when the day and night are 12 hours everywhere. This period of time is summer in the north and winter in the south. It's about 93 and a half days long. Here's the winter solstice. It's about 13 days before perihelion. This is the period of time. This period of time is fall in the north and spring in the south. It's almost 90 days long. Why the difference in time is because the orbit of the Earth is variable around the sun. In the north, you get 93 and a half days of summer and almost 90 days of fall. Here's the vernal equinox. This period of time is winter in the north and summer in the south. It's almost 89 days long. This period of time is spring in the north and fall in the south, and it's almost 93 days long. The point I want to make here is that the Earth is not traveling along its orbit at a constant speed. I'm going to explain why later. Hipparchus didn't know why, but he did know that the Earth travels around the sun at varying speed, and if the orbit were circular, it would be slightly off-center. Why does tilt matter? Take two rectangular plates and tilt one by 45 degrees. If you looked at them straight on, one looks shorter. Let's look at these plates sideways. The sun's rays hit the vertical plate straight on. For the tilted plate, some of the rays miss the plate. If this was sunlight, the vertical plate receives more solar energy, the tilted plate receives less. This animation demonstrates why there are variations in the weather and time of day while seasons change. The pane on the lower right shows you the angle of the sun's rays during different times of the year. The pane on the upper right shows you why the angle of the sun's rays change given your position on the Earth. And on the left, this shows the Earth orbiting the sun. If I move the time bar to the vernal equinox, and if I move the position of the person to the equator, you can show the sun's rays are directly overhead. The days are 12 hours and the nights are 12 hours. I can then animate this and you can see how the sun line shifts over the year. And notice how the sun's rays, the angle of the rays changes. If I now move this to the summer solstice, you can see the sun is directly overhead in the northern tropic and at an angle at the equator. This is the winter solstice. Now let's look at this from an Earth perspective where the sun hypothetically orbits the Earth. And you can see how in the north the sun goes low in the sky and high in the sky. Likewise in the upper right, this is what, how the sun looks relative to the Earth as you go through the year. And then here's the Earth perspective on the left. I find these views more intuitive. This animation shows how the sun appears through the seasons from observers on Earth. This is from the perspective of the equator. 
and you notice the sun is mostly overhead. That red figure eight is called the enamel, A-N-A-L-E-M-M-A, and it's the path that the sun travels over the year. And now we'll change the latitude to a more northerly latitude. This is on the uh, northern tropic, and you see the sun's path goes directly overhead in the spring, and this is in the south. The sun's path is directly overhead in the fall. And now we'll go much farther north. And you'll see here the sun never gets directly overhead. It gets quite low in the winter and somewhat higher in the summer. Because of something called lapsidal precession, the Earth's closest point slowly rotates counterclockwise. It takes about 134,000 years for the closest point to revolve once. Hipparchus also figured out that the solstices and equinox process with a period of about 25,771 years. You can see that precession in the animation on the right. With these two forms of precession, it takes about 21,600 years for the closest point to rotate once. That's when the closest point will return to the same date. Hipparchus understood himself to find the distances and sizes of the sun and moon. He improved upon Aristarchus' measurements and calculations. Arist Hipparchus did this by measuring the size of the sun that could be seen during a solar eclipse that was partial in Alexandria and total in Nicaea, his birthplace. At the same time, an observer in Nicaea saw the entire sun blocked by the moon, and an observer in Alexandria saw one-fifth of the sun's disk. Given that the apparent size of the sun was half a degree, this was one-tenth of a degree. The angle theta is 0.1 degree. Under normal circumstances, the angle theta would not equal these angles mu. Consider, however, that the moon is very far away. This means that this line and this line are nearly parallel. Hipparchus used a small angle approximation and thus assumed that mu and theta would be equal. This difference in perspective is called parallax, which I described earlier. Parallax is where the position of an object differs when viewed from different positions. The eclipse that was total in Nicaea was not total in Alexandria. I want to construct this geometrically with Sketchpad. First, I'll draw the Earth. And then I'll draw the Moon. And now I want to construct a vertical line to locate the top and bottom of the Moon. Now I'll locate Nikkei on the surface of the Earth. And now I'll draw a line that is from Nikkei that's tangential to the top of the moon and another that's tangential to the bottom. Now, this segment here is going to be the diameter of the sun. I'm extending a vertical line so I can keep the sun radius segment vertical, and I want to make the moon a little bit smaller. Now I'll make a segment that's the sun's diameter, and I'll bisect it, and from there I can draw a circle that represents the sun. And I'll label this sun. This point is Alexandria, and I'll now extend a ray from Alexandria through the top of the moon and another through the bottom.
I'm now going to measure the diameter of the sun and the portion of the sun that's visible from Alexandria. Remember that the eclipse is total from Nicaea. So I'll divide the length of the visible segment by the total diameter of the sun. And remember that Hipparchus measured this to be 1 to 5. And I can shorten the diameter of the sun so that it's close to 1 to 5. This isn't critical in this geometric construction. I just want to show you that I can do this. So let me hide all these reference lines. Now I'm going to draw a line segment from Nikkei to the bottom of the moon and sun. And then I'll draw a segment from Alexandria through the bottom of the moon. It reaches the middle of the sun one-fifth of the way up. The last segment I'll draw is from Alexandria to the bottom of the sun. Hipparchus suggested that the sun was so far away that these two red lines were nearly parallel. That meant that the angle formed by Nicaea point B in Alexandria was nearly equal to the angle formed by Nicaea point D in Alexandria. This is called the small angle approximation. If you were taking a geography class and you said these two angles were equal, you would get an F on your test. Hipparchus did this as an approximation because he felt the sun was very far away. You might consider this a cheat. Orbital dynamics has a few things like this where the answer isn't exact but is nonetheless very close. Hipparchus went on to solve this with another geometric construction that I'll recreate here. First, I'll draw the Earth. Next, I'll draw a horizontal reference line. When Hipparchus observed the eclipse, the moon was at a declination of three degrees. That means the Earth's equator was tilted down by three degrees. I'll show that here. And I'm going to hide the horizontal reference line. I want to construct a segment from the center of the Earth along the Earth's equator. So I'm going to create points, equatorial points on the Earth's circle. And then I'll create a segment here. And now I want to rotate that by 31 degrees, which is the latitude of Alexandria. And I'll rotate that again by 41 degrees, which is the latitude of Nicaea. And now I'll construct a point for Nicaea and one for Alexandria. Now I'll construct a horizontal ray, and I'll put the moon along this horizontal line. In the previous geometric constructions, we focus on a point on the edge of the moon. So we draw this line segment here. We're not going to do that here. Here we're going to focus on the center of the moon. This introduces an error. Hipparchus wanted an approximation, so this error is insignificant. Now I'll construct segments from Nicaea to the moon and Alexandria to the moon. And I'll construct a segment between them. This is called the chord. I'll label the origin of the Earth as O. I'll label the moon.
and now I'll construct a ray from the center of the earth through Nikea. So I can define this point here, which I'll label Z. And I'm going to hide this reference line. Here I'm measuring the angle formed by Nikea, the moon, and Alexandria. As I said in the previous slide, Hipparchus measured this to be one degree. So this drawing's not to scale. I'll next measure the angle formed by Z, O, and the moon, and the angle formed by Z, Nikea, and the moon. Hipparchus believed the moon was very far away, so he asserted that these angles also were approximately equal. This is another instance where if in geometry class you said these angles were equal, you would have been wrong. But in Hipparchus' thinking, it was a close approximation. We want to measure the distance to the moon from Alexandria. Hipparchus also asserted that the distance was approximately the same as from Nikea. So the length of these segments is, is nearly the same. And then the length of this segment is the radius of the Earth. This sets up the geometric construction. So now we can do the algebra to measure the distance from the Earth to the moon. So let's do the algebraic calculations. Let's start with the Earth and incline the line of the equator downward slightly. Let's call O the center of the Earth. The moon will be M. This line segment is the distance from the center of the Earth to the moon. The declination of the moon is the angle between this line segment and the equator. And we'll call that delta. Hipparchus knew that this was minus three degrees. We want to know the distance from the surface of the moon, Earth to the moon. So let's call that D. This includes the radius of the moon, which is 1,737 kilometers. It also was a small error that doesn't affect the answer appreciably. Let's put Alexandria here and Nikea here. We'll draw a line segment from the Earth's origin to Alexandria and from the Earth's origin to Nikea. These segments are equal to the radius of the Earth. The latitude of Alexandria is the angle from the Earth's equator to Alexandria. We'll call that phi sub a, and Hipparchus knew this was 31 degrees. The latitude of Nikea is the angle from the equator as well. We'll call that phi sub n, and Hipparchus knew this was 41 degrees. This line segment is the line of sight from Alexandria to the moon, and this line segment is the line of sight from Nikea to the moon. This angle is the difference in the totality of the eclipse or the parallax. Hipparchus measured this to be 0.1 degrees. The zenith point in Nikea is here. Sigma is this angle here between the moon and the origin of the Earth and the zenith point of Nikea. We compute it by taking the difference between the latitude of Nikea phi sub n and the declination of the moon delta. It's 41 minus 3 or 38 degrees. Sigma prime is this angle here. And then similar to the previous slides, the line segment NM and OM are nearly parallel. That means sigma is almost equal to sigma prime. Hipparchus used this to simplify his calculations. Now let's draw a line between Nikkei and Alexandria. This isn't the distance between Nikkei and Alexandria. The Earth is a sphere with a curved surface. Hipparchus knew this. One of the things Hipparchus developed was a chord function. It gives us the length of the line segment AH given the angle NOA. Um, the angle NOA is the difference between the latitudes of Nikkei and Alexandria. It's 41 degrees minus 31 degrees or 10 degrees. Let's call this angle here theta. And then here's the chord function that computes the length an. 
the Earth's radius is 6,371 kilometers. And Hipparchus knew uh, thank, that thanks to Eratosthenes, the chord function for 10 degrees is 0.1743. The length of AN is thus 1,111 kilometers. The triangle in red is an isosceles triangle. Two of the sides are equal, and we know their lengths, so the radius of the Earth. That means that the angles ONA and OAN are equal. The sum of all three angles is 180 degrees. So ONA and OAN are equal to 180 minus the angle NOA divided by 2. We know from a previous equation that NOA is 5 sub N minus 5 sub A, or 10 degrees. 180 minus 10 divided by 2 is 85 degrees. Now we can compute the, the um, angle ZNA. It's 180 degrees minus ONA, or 95 degrees. Now we can compute theta, or MNA. Geometrically, it's ZNA minus sigma prime, which we know is very close to ZNI mi minus sigma. That's 95 minus 38 degrees, or 57 degrees. For triangle MAN, we know two of the angles and one of the sides. Based on this, we can compute the length of the line segment MA. The law of sines states that the ratio of the length of a side over the sine of the opposite angle is the same for all three angles. The length of um, MA is thus equal to AN times the sine of theta over the sine of mu which is 1,111 times the sine of 57 degrees over the sine of 0.1 degrees. And if we compute the sines, that's 1,111 times 0 0.839 over 0 0.001475, which equals 533,635 kilometers. And that would be this distance d. Hipparchus also noticed that the moon had a no noticeable parallax with respect to the Earth. And remember, parallax is a change in apparent position from one perspective versus another. Here we have the moon orbiting the Earth. Here we are as an observer. Here's the moon below the horizon. We can't see it from here. Here's the moon on the horizon. And this is the distance from the moon when it's on the horizon. Now, let's start putting it in orbit. This is the distance for the moon in this position, and you'll not notice it's shorter. This is the next position, and the distance is getting shorter. And now it's right above us at the zenith point, and it's actually closest to us here. So let's compute the distance when it's on the horizon. This sets up a right triangle. Um, R is the radius of the Earth and this is R2. L is the distance from the Earth to the Moon from this point. And um, this is not where we are. It's the zenith point for another observer. We want to compute P, the distance from our line of sight. The radius of the Earth is 6,371 kilometer. And we know the distance of the Moon is 384,400 kilometer, which differs from Hipparchus's measurement that I showed you earlier. Since this is a right triangle, we can solve for P using the Pythagorean theorem. R plus L squared equals R plus P squared. <coughs> Excuse me. If we subtract R squared from both sides, we get the P squared is R plus L squared minus R squared. Let's plug in values for R and L. R plus L squared is 152701974441. One, one. R squared is 4059. 641. If we subtract, we get 152697914800. To solve for P, we take the square root of that, and this equals the 390,766 kilometers. The distance of the moon when it's at zenith is 384,400 kilometers, which is up here. That is less than the distance of the moon when it's on the horizon, 390. 1,766 kilometer. If we take the difference, we see that when the moon is on the horizon, it's 
5,365 kilometers farther away than when it's at nadir. This makes intuitive sense since the radius of the Earth is 6,371 kilometer. We think the moon looks larger when it's on the horizon. This is most notable when the moon is full. We've proven, however, that it's actually smaller. Its greater size is an optical illusion. Remember that the moon and sun is observed from the Earth are about half a degree in diameter. This image is in the proper perspective. Why do the sun and the moon appear to be so small? Well, this is how they actually are. Sunlight, when it hits the atmosphere, is scattered. This is especially true for blue light, like I said earlier. The sun literally lights up the whole sky. Maybe that's why it seems much bigger than it actually is. When viewed on the horizon, the sun and moon look much bigger, as I told you on the previous slide. That's an optical illusion. The other thing that makes us think the sun is bigger are, are images that we see in books, on the internet, and elsewhere. Pictures like this one are a lot more interesting, however, they're way out of perspective. This regrettably gives us a false perspective of our solar system. If we were in a spaceship farther away from the Earth, here's how the sun and the moon would look. Notice the moon got smaller and the sun didn't. While we're farther away from both the moon and the Earth, it makes sense that they'd be smaller. The sun didn't get smaller because we're already very, very far away from it. We'd have to actually get much farther away for it to decrease in size. There's still a problem with this picture. And can you tell what it is? You see features on the Earth. The same is true for the moon. With the exception of artificial light, the Earth doesn't generate light. Reflected sunlight is what lights up the Earth. In this picture, the sun's behind the Earth. Here's what the Earth, Moon, and Sun look like with proper shading. The Earth is a barely perceptible sliver, and the Moon is all but gone. If you want to see the Earth and the Moon, you have to put the Sun behind you. Here's a view with the Moon in the foreground. Here's a view with the Earth in the foreground. The Moon is just above the Earth on the right. Here's the Earth, Moon, and Sun with the Sun in the foreground. I've circled the Earth. The Moon is so small that you can't see it. While these pictures from a picture book are more interesting, they give us a very false perspective of the solar system. Why is this important to orbital dynamics? It isn't explicitly, but if you're going to launch a satellite in Earth orbit, you have to pay attention to what is light and what is dark. In space, because there's no atmosphere, the dark parts are very cold, and the parts with um, star with the sun in very close proximity, very hot. We have a false perception of the size of the sun. On the horizon, it looks huge. We have the same false perception of the moon. Look again at the main picture. The sun occupies only half a degree. It's the same for the moon. If you have to worry about pointing a satellite at the sun or moon, if you would damage something by doing so, you only have to worry about a small portion of the sky. So that ends this part, part three. This should give you some feel for the geometry of orbiting bodies and the relative sizes. For some of you, this is a refresher to both geometry and simple algebra. One takeaway, the ancients like Aristotle, Aristarchus, Erasthenes, and Hipparchus figured all this out with simple observations. They didn't have high-powered high telescopes to confirm their theories. It took a lot of intelligence and insight for them to develop these theories.